Uh, and let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Chris Woodruff. I'm uh, the uh, uh, director, along with Nick Loom, of the uh, Firm Capabilities Group here at the uh, at the International Growth Center. Uh, and it's, uh, it's it's certainly an honor and a privilege tonight uh, for me to chair this session with uh, uh, with uh, Professor John Sutton, um, uh, who is the Sir John Hicks Professor of Economics here at at, L at LSE. Um, I first came to know John's work when I was a graduate uh, student and uh, was uh, was was presented with uh, with his book Sunk Costs and Market Structure, which uh, which reminded me of a. Of, of a quote that was on the on the uh, jacket cover of uh, Friedman and Schwartz Monetary History, uh, monumental for its sheer bulk. And I say that not because it was long-winded, but because the breadth of issues that it covered, and that it covered in a, a very deep understanding of, uh, of of the issues and of and of markets, uh, firms, and industrial organization. And I raised that uh, book tonight in part because. The work that uh, John has has been doing uh, with the IGC in, in Africa in mapping firms uh, in uh, several African countries, uh, which which is uh, I think the basis of what he'll he'll talk about tonight. Um, he he described last year as he presented it as just descriptive, and I, w I want to while in some senses that may be he may feel that's a, 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 a an accurate uh, description of the work. I, I want to make it clear that his, it's just descriptive from the perspective of someone who has a very deep understanding of the issues and a very deep understanding of markets. And, uh, and uh, I think you'll find it, uh, as, as I did, very illuminating uh, with, respect to what the, uh, with, what, with respect to what the issues are. So with that, let me turn the floor over to, to, to Professor Sutton. Uh, we'll have his remarks, and then we'll have time for questions and answers uh, afterwards. So. Uh, John? Right, guys. Um, I got my arm twisted by Robin and Chang Gang, um, and against my better judgment, I gave in and I said I'd give this lecture on what is a horribly controversial area. Um, and I'm going to try to be terribly non controversial, of course, uh, about this subject. But it may be that during the course of this talk, somebody uh, gets really upset and uh, I am faced with some very angry questions. So I'm going to uh, forewarn you right now that if anybody asks me any really angry questions, uh, I reserve the right to use the Kate Winslet defense. You may know that Kate got an Emmy over the weekend, and it's been going around the web ever since. And uh, a reporter asked her yesterday, uh, when she gave her speech, why did she say all those foolish things? And Kate said, and now I'm going to quote from today's newspaper, um, well, you open your mouth and uh, you begin to talk and what comes out comes out. And there's not a lot you can do about it. I want you to remember this. going to lull you into a full sense of security to begin with by showing you one of my favorite movies. Some 15 years ago, the World Bank and various other donors financed the building of eight cashew nut processing factories in Tanzania so that instead of sending out agricultural products, you'd be getting some value-added processing in the country. Great idea. Here's what happened when Peter Jay, presenting his television program, arrived in his lovely white chief to see one of these Tanzanian cashew nut processing factories. What I would like to do is to tell you what happens when he walks into this factory. He discovers beautifully functioning equipment, and he presses the button, and all the machines go round and round. The factory is empty, there are no cashew nuts being processed, and nothing is happening. Now, he wonders why this is so, and there are great debates about whether this particular, why this particular uh, activity didn't prove to uh, work. And uh, I used to wonder about this myself. And then I met a man in Tanzania just six weeks ago called Mr. Mohammed, 
and uh, he told me his take on the story. His take on the story goes like this, that he now has, as part of Muhammad Enterprises, a very commercially successful cashew nut processing facility. And what's happening is that he's not using machines. If you're going to make cashew nuts, your problem is that a lot of them get broken in the process. And your problem is how do you sell the brokenness, as they're called. Now, if you have a large local market, as you do in Brazil, middle-income people, they'll buy all sorts of cashew-based products and you can sell the brokenness. In Tanzania, there's no domestic market for the brokenness. That means that the brokenness are a complete loss. And it's actually more effective for Mr. Mohammed to run his now commercially successful operation using a manual process of the kind used in India where he gets 80 to 90 percent yield of good ones and only 10 to 20 percent brokens as opposed to 60 percent to 70 percent brokens with the machine. In other words, this was a bad commercial decision. That's story number one. I want to juxtapose that with story number two. There was a man who decided to make matchboxes a few years ago. He thought, let's have some <coughs> domestically made matchboxes instead of importing them from abroad. That's an easy thing that we can make. And so he set up a matchbox making factory and he was very pleased with his productivity. He was making a matchbox at a unit cost of 38 cents, 38 per. And he thought that was pretty good. A month after he opened production, he got a letter from China, from a company that says, we will deliver identical matchboxes to the one you're making, delivered, net, uh, including transport costs, to your factory door for two, rather than 38 per. So it's very hard in Ethiopia manufacturing something that's not going to be undercut by Chinese imports. So let me give you a good example of something that is manufactured successfully without any such fears. Mohan Kothari Industries is a mid-size Ethiopian company that makes drawn wire. You make drawn wire out of steel bar, you have a machine that pulls the bar, it makes it longer and thinner, and you keep doing that for a long time and soon it's wire. Now you can make useful stuff like barbed wire out of it. Now, how did Mohan Kotari establish that that was a commercially successful enterprise? And why will they not be undercut? The answer is that this family were in trading for 30 years before they entered manufacturing. And they know the markets for inputs and outputs in great detail. They know that there's a shortage of the appropriate grade of steel in China. China, at the margin, is importing from various countries, including the Ukraine. So by going to the Ukraine and importing his bar from the Ukraine, he knows that given the transport costs of this sort of stuff from China, he is an absolutely safe market opportunity. What lessons should we draw from these stories? Well, the usual lesson the economists would like to draw from these stories is that getting businesses decisions is best left to businesses. What I've been telling you is that getting a good business decision made is hard for governments. All economists love to tell us this all the time. I've also been telling you that it's very hard for businesses. Trying to find a profitable opportunity or a gap in the market is a very hard thing to do. Now, economists like, well, certain kinds of economists like to draw from this kind of story the lesson that governments should be very slow to intervene in any market-specific way, and they should back off and use the kind of approach to enterprise policy that has become standard over the past 15 years. The standard view of the subject is that what governments should do is to create a good business environment 
that will serve all firms of the economy, take away all obstacles that are unnecessary in the face of business expansions, and do nothing else. Now, that might seem to be very good liberal economics advice. And certainly, it's a very defensible position. But imagine that um, you were the prime minister of some country into whose office uh, Mr. Wolfenstein came some years ago, and he showed you the investment climate surveys, and he showed you the 20 or 30 or 40 things that were deficiencies in your present scheme. Well, I'm reminded by that scenario of the kind of work I do in benchmarking. I've benchmarked industries for the Indian government, from machine tools to auto components, over the past 10 years. And when I do that kind of exercise, I could easily come up with 100 things that are wrong in the Indian machine tool industry. And when I presented to CEOs, if I gave them a list of 100 things that were wrong, they wouldn't be very impressed. They know all these things are wrong. They know they can't fix most of them. And this is not helpful. What I have to do is to find two or three big fixable things, things that are going to really make a difference and which can be fixed. Now, I think economists, in talking about industrial policy, need to have the same approach. Tell me a few big fixable things. And by the end of this talk, I'm going to come to my lesson. And my lesson is going to be that implementation trumps diagnosis. That I could spend an awful lot of time telling you exactly what the optimal policy was, and I'd convince nobody. And meanwhile, there are some big fixable things over there, and it would be much better to devote your time and your effort to finding implementable, practical ways of fixing those things. So that's the thrust of my trip. Now, the payoff to government, I would argue, from a deep understanding of current capabilities and the next opportunities lies in focusing and prioritizing its efforts which is a fancy way of saying what I've just said. It's that at which I'm directing the Enterprise Map Program, which attempts to provide a low-level public good that has not been available in many countries. If I do work on industry in America, Japan, or Europe, I always have a very rich body of secondary sources, business directories, and so on, which can give me a very strong baseline understanding of any industry or any firm before I ever go near them. And yet, in Ethiopia, it's very hard to put your hand on such information. So the idea here is to do a systematic description of the capabilities of where they come from across 50 or so leading companies spread across the different industrial sectors, and then an industry overview showing you how the different clusters of firms operate within different industries. And the key thing is understanding that an industry is not a homogeneous group of firms, but a group of clusters of firms, each of which are doing a different thing, which are essentially not competing with each other most of the time. And so identifying these capabilities, where they're spread, where they come from, provides a point of departure. It provides the basic elementary material that you need before you can start to talk sensibly about any of these issues. So that I'll come back to later. For the moment, I want to ask some questions about what kind of industries you see. I want to tell you about something I call relevant capabilities this evening. Because this question of capabilities has been floating around business schools for a very long time. And it's only now that economists are beginning to use the word. To an economist, it means something very simple at the level of observable outcomes. It just means the level of quality and productivity that you can deliver across each possible market in which you might enter. But underlying that is a whole lot of stuff inside the firm. The question is, when we say productivity and quality, we're really talking about what shifts your cost curve or what shifts your demand curves. Those are the things that will determine your profitability, your viability in the long run, your potential to employ people. And so we we'll want to ask, what are the cost shifters, what are the demand shifters? It's the demand shifter that nearly always matters most. Uh, most firms don't worry much about productivity because they've got low wages to offset it. And generally, they're not worried about their unit wage costs. They're generally worried about the fact that you can't sell anything 
against imported products or international markets unless you meet global quality standards these days. And the real challenges lie here. So we're all the time worried about what is a demand shifter and how do you shift out the demand for your product. Now, the industries that you find everywhere, the capabilities that seem to be always in place, no matter what country you go to, with some exceptions, uh, you know, in some countries there's not much mark for beer, people don't print much beer, but by and large, industries like this, beer, cement, and sugar, you find everywhere. So the capability of actually having a firm that functions and produces stuff is not in general a problem. The, these industries have some characteristics that mean that even if your productivity is poor and your quality might not be the best, you'll still probably be able to have a viable firm. And we want to ask, what are the capabilities required here and what are the capabilities not needed? What are the additional capabilities that will be necessary if substantial advances are to be made into mid-level manufacturing? Because that is the 25-year challenge. Selling to a safe local market. If you're selling cement, you've got high transport costs. If you're selling beer, your local brand can probably survive against even an imported product. You're generally selling into a relatively safe local market, which is a sizable market. You have high transport costs that protect you to some degree. The key thing, as you move from this kind of industry into mid-level manufacturing, is that in mid-level manufacturing, most things are intermediate products. And they fit into other products. And you become part of an international supply chain. And you can't get into those chains unless you have very high quality standards. And it's this point that looms largest when you ask the question, over the next couple of decades, are we going to see people moving into mid-level manufacturing? I'm going to ask a question about who exports what, because I want to put this in perspective. I don't want to go through a lot of uh, statistical analysis this evening, but I want to just pose the following question. If I look across countries at different levels of wealth, and I ask, who's exporting what? Who are the people that are exporting mid-level manufacturing goods? There are various ways you can do this using published statistics. It has become a very popular question to ask in recent years. There's a literature on this. And I'm going to try not to get wrapped up in that literature this evening and in the controversy surrounding it. I'm going instead to operate immediately at a very crude, highly aggregate level, at the cost of making a rather arbitrary list of things. I'm going to ask. What are the industries that are at a very, very low state of development in sub-Saharan Africa? And what are those in, uh, and uh, what are the countries that are beginning to export substantially in those industries? So what I'm going to take is what I would call the core of manufacturing industry. These are things like plastics, metals, power generating machinery, etc. Um, office machines, telecom equipment, electrical machinery, road vehicles, transport equipment, and so on and so forth. So I'm defining roller arbitrarily for the purpose of just giving you a snapshot picture. The central core of the non-easy manufacturing industries, the ones where you need these kinds of capabilities I've been talking on about fitting into international supply chains and meeting international quality standards. And I'm going to ask the question, with this arbitrary definition, who exports what? And I want to show you a picture here. On the horizontal axis of this picture is how wealthy a country is. Poor countries on the left, rich countries on the right. Log GDP per capita. On the vertical axis, I'm going to show you what fraction of a country's exports are made of these mid and high level manufacturing goods. And it turns out that as you move over to the right of this diagram, unsurprisingly, you find an upward movement. You find that countries at the bottom end, and I've marked Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Ghana, have very little of their export basket devoted to these mid-level manufacturing goods. Eastern Europe has, of course, become enormously oriented towards the production of these goods over the past 20 years. I've shown Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Poland. But I also want to point out to you that 
There are an awful lot of points over in this part of the diagram. Here you'll see New Zealand and Norway. They don't export in their export baskets a lot of middle to high level manufacturing exports because New Zealand has very productive uh, agricultural exports and Norway, of course, has oil. And so this isn't a necessary condition for getting rich. I want to make that very clear. Nonetheless, I'm going to focus on the question, if this is the direction you want to take, what are the challenges in building up capabilities? And I want to talk about what the relevant capabilities are as you move over to the right of the diagram. So I want to ask, well, who's doing what? Where will the advancing capabilities come from? And what barriers are they facing in building up those kinds of capabilities? Where do current capabilities come from? In the enterprise map of Ethiopia, one of the most important things I wanted to find out was if I took Ethiopia's top industrial companies, so 80 or 90 of these, and I picked a representative sample that covered everything, so I've got some representation in every important submarket across the industrial sector. When I use industry in this context, I mean uh, manufacturing, agribusiness, and construction. And I look at the top companies there, and I ask, well, where do those companies come from? And the interesting thing is that those companies have, by and large, not grown out of people that were small manufacturers. The notion that uh, we can foster very small three-person companies and suddenly they grow up to be big employers, it happens very rarely. Out of the top 50, um, 26 out of the 50 were neither foreign nor were initially public enterprises. In other words, they were private sector companies. And of the 26, 24 of them had started life as traders. Like the uh, wire drawing, Mohan uh, Kotari group I mentioned earlier, they had a generation of experience in trading and they really knew what markets to enter. And they had very well functioning mid sized companies and they moved in as a mid sized manufacturer when they moved into manufacturing and they knew what they were doing. Only two of the 26 started off as small scale manufacturers. So if you're looking to where your capabilities come from, this is the first clue. Knowing how to run a successful and efficient mid-sized company, that's a relevant capability. Having the market intelligence to know this is the safe thing to produce, this could be a good market, that's a key element of your capability. If you want to have a demand curve that's out there rather than in here, well, the best way to get a good demand shifter is to pick the right market to be in where the demand curve is far out. So you need to... Start at this level if you want to ask what are the relevant capabilities. In Tanzania, here's another clue. Tanzanians worry about the fact that there are about five large business groups that play a relatively large role across manufacturing industry. And they say to themselves, well, why are these guys doing everything? Here's the answer. It's not some bad kind of thing that's going on here. On the contrary, it's a natural second best solution to a certain kind of economic environment. There's a whole literature on business groups in India and other countries. Business groups prosper where there's a shortage of capabilities in the sense of a well-functioning mid-sized firm. If there's a limited number of such firms or individuals who can successfully put together and run such firms, then what's going to happen is that those firms will find lots of opportunities that are not exploited by others, and they'll fill the gap in the market so they'll expand horizontally across a wide range of activities. So this is just what we should expect to see with any understanding of underlying economic mechanisms. Ghana. Here's another symptom of the same thing. If you're short of companies, what happens if one of these well-functioning companies gets into trouble? Well, because there are gaps in the market everywhere, the best thing to do is to jump with your capable, well-run company into the production of something entirely different. The uh, Aquafresh used to be a textile company, then it moved into making soft drinks, completely unrelated industries. But they had the underlying capability of running a mid-sized company well, and so they were able to jump horses. Another clue as to where we should be looking in terms of asking, what is the scarce resource? 
Because, of course, we're asking here the economist's question. When I first started to study economics, too many years ago to be admitted to when it was, there was a new book on the market that was a big fat book. And I took it out, and it was about entrepreneurship in developing countries. And it was edited by a very well-known and distinguished uh, development economist called uh, Kilby. And he had a lovely chapter in it called Hunting the Heffalump. Now, if you weren't brought up reading Winnie the Pooh, this may, uh, this may puzzle you a little bit. Uh, this is how a child says elephant. And so you are hunting the elephant. And this is a great big thing you're hunting, but it's very hard to find them. What these guys were looking for was the alleged scarcity of entrepreneurs. And what they discovered is the one thing that Africa wasn't short of was entrepreneurs. They were everywhere. Wonderful. What they really lacked was the middle managers to hire in order to weld them into a successful, well-run, mid-sized company. I'm coming back to the same script. I'm telling you that the scarce resource here is not entrepreneurs in that narrow sense. It's something richer and more nuanced than that. Now, I don't want to get myself into trouble with the people from the entrepreneurship literature, so let me just say that again. Um, I'm disagreeing with a particular way of telling the story about shortage of entrepreneurs. I'm nuancing it by saying, look, what we want is guys that are in the business of managing and well-functioning mid-sized firm. That's where the employment generation is coming from. Now, the next thing that I want to raise is the question of where is the demand shifter not to be found? The literature keeps talking about technology. And the reason that they do that is economists like to talk about technology. I like to talk about technology. It's interesting. But go to Ethiopia or Tanzania and ask, what is the scarce resource? Remember, we're economists here. And between friends, we can admit that what we guys do is we try to emulate Adam Smith, and we try to go from scarcity to value. So if we want to ask, how does a country get rich? It's got to have some capabilities that are relatively scarce. And this relative scarcity is going to drive the relative value of that capability. So it's really important to ask, well, what's missing? What's the hard thing to get? Now, a very good way of thinking about it is, what are the things that any firm could buy off the shelf? By definition, those are not scarce capabilities. That's not where the value is coming from. And technology, at the low end, the left-hand side of the scatter diagram I showed you, you can buy off the shelf. A textile manufacturer gets his quality standards in manufacturing by buying the right machine. End of story. His challenges, his capabilities, have to do with more subtle things. Getting into international supply chains, meeting uh, conditions for constant flexibility in production, switching over his production line, responding to department stores, ever-changing needs for different designs. That's the interesting stuff. So go to Ethiopia and ask yourself, what was happening in soft drinks 10 or 12 years ago? Ethiopia was importing a lot of fruit juices and soft drinks. Seems completely unnecessary. Now, there's a whole range of firms that are making those things. Import substitution has been extremely successful. People used to say, the reason that we don't make these locally is that we can never compete with these flashy imported brands. They look better on the shelf. But the fact is that there are guys going around firms in sub-Saharan Africa, knocking on doors, saying, please can I sell you this production line? The Tetra Pak company for $100,000 will put in an entire production line where you just have to put the oranges in at one end and you get beautifully international standard package orange juice coming out at the end, and they will train your people for six months to use it until you've got that international standard orange juice coming out at the end, so that is not the scarce resource. 
That's not where to be looking. If that was the problem, uh, the international agencies would have solved development 50 years ago. So, here's my big message. If it's not technology, what is it? So I'm going to bring you up the spectrum now, away from soft drinks and orange juice, and I'm going to move to that middle range, where we move from the poor countries through the middle countries to the rich countries on that diagram. And I'm going to ask about that transition, where you shift up to the middle ground manufacturing industries. And the quintessential industry here is auto components. So let me tell you about auto components. I benchmarked this in India and China a few years ago and for the World Bank and uh, for the local Indian industry. And it is an astonishing story. The multinational car makers came to India and China around 1995. There were a couple of exceptions that came earlier, but they're special cases. Within eight years, when I was benchmarking this in 2003, and I was benchmarking quality standards, it's really easy to do in auto components, unlike machine tools, it's, uh, where it's really hard. But in auto components, they have an extraordinary way of benchmarking themselves every week. And all the charts are up on the wall, quality standards of all kinds for every unit made in the factory. Within eight years, these guys had moved from being zeros, out of the window, unable to sell, to being very, very close to world-class standards in eight years. An astonishing transformation. And the question is, what's important about this industry? Well, what's magic about this industry is, first of all, that it's organized vertically. The car makers buy from the first tier suppliers who buy their parts from the second tier suppliers. Vertical organization. And secondly, the most dramatic codification of knowledge that exists in manufacturing industry. The, uh, the car industry worldwide was taught by Toyota, <laughs> as were the other Japanese producers back in the 1970s, that there was a better way of making cars. After eight years of denial, they finally just copied and everybody these days makes cars exactly the same way. It's an incredible codification of production. If you're in Slovenia and you want to sell auto components to Volkswagen, all they'll do is give you a business card from a consulting firm who will bring you almost into the window. And then you'll be qualified to have a serious conversation with Volkswagen. Then, if you're a smart operator, you'll take a large loss-making contract at very bad prices with a first-year uh, automaker so that you can learn and get fully into the quality window. After that, you can make money. But that's how you build your capability. And the way that knowledge is transferred is through the movement of engineers back and forth between the two companies. Because here's the second magic thing. In that vertical relationship, incentives are exactly aligned. The Brazilians used to complain in the 1960s that they wanted American machine tools to be made in Brazil. But the American machine tool makers would only ever give them the last year's model range, the model range that was becoming obsolete. They didn't want to transfer the technology. But in auto components, you have aligned incentives. Ford or General Motors wants the Indian producer to be world class, because now he has a low cost, low price world class producer, instead of importing it at a higher price. Meanwhile, the local Indian guy wants to come up to world-class standards because after this loss-making contract, he can move to future profitable contracts because he's no longer a learner. The alignment of incentives and codification of knowledge make auto components special. But auto components, in another sense, is typical of mid-ground manufacturing. And that is, quality standards are the key to everything. And, and this is the important bit, what lies behind those quality standards is not technological know-how, but the mastery of standardized working practices. I was walking down a corridor uh, in a Chinese auto seat maker some years ago, and this guy passed me by, and he didn't look Chinese to me, so being curious, I stopped and had a conversation with him. Uh, I said to him, you don't look like you come from here. No, he said, I come from India. I said, I thought you might. I said, where exactly do you come from? He said, Pune. Oh, I said, I was in your plant last week. Uh, one of the five best seat-making plants in the world. 
So I said, why are you in China? He said, I've come to sort out the Chinese. So I said, that's a very good thing to do. So I said, how long will it take you? He said, six months. So I said, what do you do? I said, I suppose you take away those sewing machines, you change that production line, you do that, all the OR stuff. Yeah, he said. I said, how long will that take? He said, about a week. I said, what do you do in the second week? He said, I'll talk to people. I said, what do you tell them? Well, I'll tell them the obvious stuff. There's no quality controller at the end of the line. If you move your car seat to the next person, and there's one stitch which is a millimeter out, Ford will reject it. This is a visible surface. It's got to be perfect. So never pass it forward with a mistake. So you've got a whole different way of doing things, and this is the way the Japanese do it. Every manufacturer in India will tell you, we take our uh, technology from America and Europe and our working practices from Japan. <laughs> this is just common sense. You guys know how to do it. And the point about this is that these working practices are notoriously hard to change. It's much better to come in on a greenfield site. You can be world class in 10 months on a greenfield site. If you have to turn around an existing seat maker like this Indian chap was trying to do in China, he takes three to five years to become world class. He was going to spend six months talking to these guys, telling them the same thing week after week, until finally he had brought them around to his way of doing things. He was hoping to cut that three to five year turnaround into a much shorter period. So working practices trump technical know-how. When you move past the middle group into the top manufacturing industries, then it's knowledge of technology that becomes the dominant thing. But if you're trying to make that transition, the real challenge is changing working practices. So this is where we start to analyze the capabilities. So all the components is right, uh, at about 0.4 of the distance across that diagram. Working practice is still dominant. Now, I've already told you about recapturing the domestic market for soft drinks and the fact that that isn't where technology matters. Now I'm going to go back to Mohan Kotari with their drawn wire and tell you what technology does there. I said to the man at Mohan Kotari, well, when you started to make your drawn wire with your bar importer from the Ukraine, how did you get your technology? He said, we hired an engineer. I said, one guy? He said, one guy. How many men does it take to supervise and show you how to work one machine? One guy. So you hire one person, you've got your technology. So that wasn't the problem. The problem was having the market know-how and the depth of understanding of the markets to know this was what to make. And to have a well-functioning, efficient company that could make it well and efficiently over time. Now I'm going to talk about the role of foreign direct investment, because now I'm coming to the heart of my talk. I told you that if you want to make that transition, that quality standards are hard. Now there are ways of bypassing this. You don't have to use FDI, but FDI is by far the most important single channel in the transfer of capabilities. And it transfers not horizontally across different firms or different industries, but it transfers primarily in a vertical way because of that alignment of incentives that I mentioned to you earlier. I want to offer you no glib generalizations. Notice I'm being careful tonight. I'm going to tell you right away, you don't have to do it this way. You don't want to do it this way, fine. Ireland did it entirely this way. Between 1958 and 1968, they opened up the economy, they brought in foreign companies, they offered themselves as a gateway to Europe. The foreign companies essentially took over. Irish manufacturing firms declined, they exited. Foreign companies ruled manufacturing. That's one way. Korea did it very differently. In steel, in semiconductors, they said there's a great diaspora of wonderful local scientists working in the United States. Why don't we have a massive research organization and bring them home and let them spin off companies from there? It worked fine. Sure, you can do it yourself. Had Ireland tried to do that, well, things would be even worse than they are. Right? <laughs> I work a lot there. Barat Forge in India, really smart people. You want to go it alone and avoid FDI? Be as smart as Barat Forge. Barrett Forge was practically going bankrupt. They make forgings, not much money in that. So the guys decided they were going to turn the company around. What do they do? They say, look, we've got to get from general forgings into specialist forgings. You make a forging by having a piece of metal. You have something very heavy that hits it. There's a die here that knocks it into shape. 
The great thing in forgings is how many times do I have to hit it? Because you're going to quote for contracts for 10, 20, 30,000 pieces. Get your quote wrong, you've lost money. So what I really want to know is how many times do I have to hit it? Four rather than three, you've just had a 33% cost increase and you'll be losing money on the contract. How do you find out? Well, you make a die and you try it. That's the old-fashioned way. Make a die, okay, that's just cost you $20,000. Still, you're losing money. Suppose we could calculate it mathematically instead of investing all that money in making a die. Suppose we had a really smart computer program. That's what Barrett forged. It. The only company in the world, they pioneered the use of computers to do this, and they made themselves into one of the five world-leading specialist forgers. There are only five companies in the world that are leading in specialist fine forgings. Barrett Forge is one of them. You're smart at Barrett Forge, don't worry about FDI. However, I wouldn't advise this for India. There aren't many Barrett Forges around. Mostly, most of the time, if you want supply chains and quality improvement, you're going to have to get yourself onto international markets. The way you do it is many and various. Here's the Everglory Company from uh, South uh, East China, Guangzhou. The guy who runs Ever Ready Clothing was an ex-aerospace engineer, decided to get into clothing. How do I make money in clothing? Well, he realized that what he had to do was meet international quality standards. And the way he did it is he went to the Singapore Trade Fair. Supply chains are really easy in clothing in a sense because once a year they all meet in Singapore and all the buyers meet the sellers. Everything is done for you. You don't have to start building yourself into the international supply chain. Go talk to the guys. But you've got to meet great quality standards. So he goes and he gets himself a contract with one of the Japanese department stores on the grounds that this is a terribly hard contract to make because these are the most demanding buyers in the world. And if I could meet their quality standards, I could meet anybody's. By doing that huge effort of making, reaching the standards for that contract, he transformed himself into something who could sell to anybody internationally. Great company. India's auto component makers, likewise. I've already told you about how they learned to pull themselves up in terms of quality standards. These are the kinds of challenges that you meet in mid-ground manufacturing. Setting sensible priorities depends on understanding of the existing capabilities that you've got and the current institutional set. I've been trying to pull back the discussion of uh, enterprise policy. I use this term enterprise policy because um, I'm trying to avoid saying industrial policy because that makes everyone really upset. So, you see, I'm Irish, so I'm very diplomatic. And the Irish invented this lovely term, enterprise policy, some years ago. That stops you getting hit when you say this. Um, enterprise policy, everybody has to have an enterprise policy because every government has to decide on what's the level of corporate tax rates. Once you've decided that, you've got an enterprise policy whether you want one or not. So you've all got an enterprise policy. The question is how you design it sensibly. That's what we're talking about here. In order to design it sensibly, you've got to first of all understand the current capabilities and prospects of companies and sectors in the economy and the current institutional setting in which they operate. So what we're trying to do here is talk about what I'm going to call big fixable problems. Because what I'm going to tell you is that we could spend ages arguing in a bad-tempered way among ourselves as economists about what is a good enterprise policy, what's a better enterprise policy, how do we optimally design the enterprise policy. Now, I'm trying to pull us out of that really unhelpful argument. And I'm trying to say that when you actually look at where you're trying to get to and what you're doing, maybe it will be a good idea for us to proceed in a piecemeal way by looking at big, fixable, obvious problems. Because diagnosis is easy. We economists could spend our time beating ourselves up, diagnosing this beautifully, and it wouldn't really help us a lot. Because diagnosis is 5% of the problem. 95% of the problem is implementation. That's what's hard, making it happen. So I can find quite easily for you big fixable problems that are worth fixing. And it should be pretty uncontroversial that these should be fixed. And the challenge is finding ways of doing it. So I want to just change the spotlight in this area. 
by asking you to think about big fixable problems because they hit you in the face once you start to build an enterprise map. Let me tell you about a Tanzanian story. I'm going to tell you about one of the big issues, access to land. Anna Temu was a very interesting woman in Tanzania, came from a village in the middle of the country. Uh, she was doing business from the age of 11, raising uh, chickens to sell eggs on the local market, and she came home from school. By the time she was uh, at university, she had extended her business into having a small flour milling business. Uh, then she got a great break. Uh, under a USA program, uh, she got an opportunity to spend some time at the University of Illinois, uh, and she was sent there in order to learn how to build and operate a soya extruder machine. But being a very clever person, she looked around, she listened, she found out about what was going on, about what other people were doing, and she realized, I'll never make money with a soya extruder or sell it flour. I've got to get into an interesting niche in the market. And she realized the niche of the future was health foods and high nutrition foods. So she went back and she built herself a lovely mid-sized company that specializes in a whole range of branded health foods and nutrition, uh, high nutrition foods. The trouble is she's operating on a very small plot of land. She built all a larger plot of land in her own name so she could expand. For the past five years, she has been trying to get permission through the administration to change the title deeds of her new plot of land from her own name to the name of her company. If she doesn't do this, she can't operate on that land as a company. Uh, this is five years of pain. So difficulties in the administration of land title can be a big problem. This is eminently fixable. Now let me tell you a contrasting story. Let me tell you the story of uh, Gagan Gopta and Kamal Seals. He has no problem with that. He's a steel maker from India. He comes to Tanzania, he says, look, there's an awful lot of scrap steel here. There's a lot of people making uh, steel out of scrap steel. This is a very good entry-level manufacturing business that brings you into interesting areas. So he sets up this uh, plant process scrap. He's no trouble with land. He goes straight to the Prime Minister. He says, look, I'll employ all these people. I'll do this. Uh, if you've ever met this man, uh, these, are both, these are both people with uh, very strong and interesting personalities. They're, they're real characters, both of these people. Really, really interesting business people. Uh, but uh, Gagan Gupta, he would just go flamboyantly into the Prime Minister and do a deal and not only did he get the land for his new plant, but he actually said he wanted five times more land than he required for this plant. Because what he was going to do was divide up all the rest of the land into little plots that he could sell off to local businessmen who wouldn't have any land ownership title. They would have permission automatically to run their business on one of his plots. So he has a lovely little business going in a very nice brochure about how you can open up a new business on one of his plots. It's a, a lovely little map uh, that he has on the, in the inside of the brochure. The lesson I want to draw is a very simple lesson. When people start making lists of obstacles to doing business, they need to remember that businessmen are very inventive people. And there are some people who just dance around certain obstacles. There are lots of ways of telling this story. I'm sure lots of people would be tempted to find other differences between these two firms that explain this or that. And I don't want to get drawn into that. I just want to point out to you that land ownership is sometimes a big problem, and sometimes it's not. But there are many things that can be bypassed, but that doesn't change the fact that getting the administration of transfer of deeds right is taking an obstacle away from exactly the kind of high capability business I've been talking about. The mid-sized company with good business acumen who knows how to get into an interesting niche in the market. This is exactly the kind of company that epitomizes where growth can come from. And if you have unnecessary obstacles there, this is a bad idea. We don't need to carefully measure the hierarchy of seriousness of problems. This is fixable and it should be fixed. So let me move on to another big fixable issue. Um, Tanzania again. Um, 
Did I forget one of these? Um, oh yeah, Ethiopian priorities. Um, second one. A World Bank survey some 10 or a dozen years ago carried out the following little exercise. Pick up the telephone to the investment agency that takes foreign direct investment into any country in sub-Saharan Africa. They discovered that seven out of 10 phone calls were not answered. Getting a good investment agency, this is an eminently fixable problem. There's a recipe. The Irish invented it, I'm proud to say, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. It's a formula that's used across the world. You have one-stop shop, you have a dedicated group of people. The offices consist of a mixture of ex-business people and ex-civil servants, so you get good political relations between the two. You have a certain salary differential which is modest because you want people that really want to help the country and are uh, dedicated to their goals. I could go on forever about how to design a good one of these, but this is common knowledge among the people in this business. So this is an eminently fixable problem. And from Ethiopia's point of view, this is a weakness. If you looked across, you can see many strengths in the way Ethiopia does things. Uh, they are extremely effective. Once they decide to do something, boy, does it get done. But deciding to do something, they take a cautious and careful and measured approach. And this is one of the things that I'd like to see more on the agenda. When they decide to do something like setting up a commodities exchange, this can be done by Prime Minister Ariel Fiat, and they've got a world-class commodities exchange that was set up in the space of about a year and a half. It's a joy to go in there and look at it. You, you could be in any city in the world. But you have to have the political will. Implementation is about two things. The decision to do it, and the administrative ability to make it happen. So now let me move on to a third big fixable problem. Tanzania again. I'm going to come back again to the manufacture of steel from scrap. Here's an issue. I told you there's an ebullient businessman who's wonderful at dancing around problems, but here's a problem he can't fix. He can't fix the fact that for very respect, economically respectable infant industry reasons, there is a tariff in place, that, or a law in place, that stops the export of scrap steel because the Tanzanians want it to be processed into steel locally. Now, that's a perfectly respectable infant industry argument. Of course, it wouldn't justify doing it forever. It wouldn't, uh, if it's subject to all the caveats about we don't want this to be a monopoly, but there are several people doing it. There's competition in the market, and there's no assumption that this is going to last beyond a certain period. So this is a very respectable economic device, but it's completely undermined by illegal exports. People take truckloads, and container loads of scrap steel, they move them to the port, and they go out illegally. Policing the law is the problem here. Simply ensuring that the law is respected. And that is the kind of specific, fixable problem I'm talking about. So what I'm talking about tonight is the notion that we don't have to get drawn into bad-tempered doctrinaire disputes. We can find big, fixable problems, and the challenge is implementation. Political will plus administrative capacity. And the more of these problems you fix, the more you build up the country's administrative capacity. That's the capability building. The ability to take a problem and just fix it. Now, I'm going to finish up with a few disclaimers. I'm just going to anticipate all the terrible things you're going to say to me. Um, you know, I, I love the phrase, uh, a human loves a story. But economists don't. Uh, I've been telling you stories. Um, why don't I do a survey? Why don't I do it systematically? Why did I not do econometrics and measure it properly? I'm not competing with the surveyors. That's fine. I'm trying to say, if you want to do a survey properly, please, at least know as much about the firms and the industries you're going to survey as I write down in the enterprise map, because that's the public good I'm giving you. I regard this just as low-level background knowledge before one should start doing, forming samples. When people form samples, they often have groups of firms 
that are completely different, not competing with each other, non-comparable in various ways. Now, if you want to measure the frequency of power outages in manufacturers in India, that's fine. Throw everyone in. But if you want to talk about the things I'm talking about tonight, you need to understand what the subpopulations are and the way they're very different. So I'm helping you to design your survey. I'm not doing it for you. Secondly, the audiences for the enterprise map. Who are they? Number one audience, government. Uh, the enterprise map of India, uh, we, we've had to send successive boxes of 50 copies because they want everybody in the Ministry of Industry to read it. This is a primer for guys who want to talk about industry. So low level public good, that's number one. Number two, businesses themselves. Businesses who are interested in investing in Ethiopia, this is exactly the information they need, which is very hard to get. That's my second audience. Third, and last, comes the researchers. I am not providing you with a data set. I am deliberately designing things so you won't get a data set out, because I don't want it to be used as some crutch. What I'm doing is I'm giving you the background knowledge so that you know the baby stuff before you do the grown-up stuff. That's it. So this is my big disclaimer. Please don't blame me for not giving you a data set. The third is the lesson that I have made central to the whole talk. I am suggesting that in talking about enterprise policy, instead of beating each other up, face up to the fact that the diagnosis is the small part of the problem, and designing good implementation strategies is the hard part. And making those implementation strategies work is the real challenge. That's where the capability building in government is really interesting. And so I'm suggesting that we can have a better humored discussion by focusing on number three. Diagnosis is easy, but implementation is the challenge. And that's where I'm going to start. Uh, hello, my name is Max Rewall. I'm a LSE Destin alumni. Uh, I, was in, I, uh, I was intrigued by two observations that you made. The first one was that in Ethiopia, only two uh, of the large enterprises today started out as small businesses. And the second one is that you stated that there is no, that there is no lack of entrepreneurs in these countries. That basically everyone seems to be a small entrepreneur. In this light, I was wondering how you feel about microfinancing which is doing exactly that, which is saying everyone has to be an entrepreneur. But apparently that's what these countries are not lacking. Kumar and Kate Cambridge. So I was wondering, what do you think of the intra-country, so for instance India, the implementation capability, if it's there, it's easy to learn, there's a huge amount of variation from state to state, and within the state itself, there is a huge amount of variation. Some, in, some areas where industries take off and others don't. So let me, let me, let me ask, answer those two immediately if I can. Okay. Um, I'll answer them in reverse order. The within India variation intrigues me, and you're absolutely right. Um, when I gave the presentation of my um, machine tool benchmarking study of India to the CEOs. Uh, the two big lessons that the CEOs wanted to emphasize from it was exactly what you've just said, huge variation. There's one brilliant firm. Uh, it was set up as a new greenfield plant firm by engineers who were sick of the bad working practices of the existing companies that employed them, and they set up by themselves. They're now the outlier. They took over the market for the core products of uh, CNC machine tools in India. Uh, they're called ACE, um, Ace Designers. And uh, they are really very, very good indeed. Now, what the CEOs said when they saw the diagram of how productive and what the quality levels were across different companies, uh, the lesson that they wanted to draw about it is why are we benchmarking against other countries? Why don't we benchmark among ourselves within the Indian industry? Because best practice in India is hugely better than average practice. So I agree 100% with your observation. The, uh, now backtracking to the first question, um, uh, I told you about the 2 out of 26 who started as small manufacturers. Um, 
Let me first of all say that um, some people do start small manufacturers and they become big. Uh, the sting in the tail of that question was, why am I not a microfinance person? Uh, so I'm going to tell you two stories. I answer everything by telling stories, sorry. Um, the first story I'm going to tell you is about Anna Temu. I've already explained to you that uh, this was somebody who came in as in the manufacturing industry, may, uh, doing flour milling. Uh, so here's somebody who started really small as a one-person business, and it's doing great. But it's doing great for reasons that are absolutely textbook economics. Lesson one of the growth of firms literature, it seems to be completely unknown in development circles, but here's lesson one of the growth of firms literature. This came out of a guy from MIT, Birch, who did it all, he tracked all the small firms in America in the 1970s and followed them for 25 years. And you find that the vast majority of them stay small. There's a tiny number that grow to be big. Everyone's interested in the tiny number. Now what's special about the tiny number? One thing, almost all of them are in new sub-markets. A sub-market is a part of a market linked to the wider market but it consists of a cluster of firms doing something different to the next cluster of firms in the market. The, it's part of a single market because these things are partial substitutes or they're linked in terms of technology, but there are different clusters of firms doing different things. Now, if you look at the fast-growing small firms, they are riding the wave of a new sub-market in almost all cases. And as soon as you tell people that, they say, ah, technology. What this guy discovered was back in the 1970s, all these guys were semiconductor firms. And of course, they were all small firms to begin with, but semiconductors got big. Wrong. The semiconductor guys are there, but they are not the typical firm. What's typical is health and fitness centers. As you all know, in 1970, were the Americans interested in health and fitness? You're not old enough to remember this. The answer is no. <laughs> By 1980, were the Americans interested in health and fitness? Wow, yes. This industry mushroomed. And if you were smart enough to open a health and fitness center in the United States in 1970, you got big and rich with high probability. That's what Anna Temu is doing. She's going to Illinois. She's seeing this is the sector that's going to grow. I'm going to get out of this commodity business and get in here. So when a small firm grows, it's because it's got an unusual person running it. Most two-person companies in Ethiopia or Tanzania are not going to have that kind of potential, They're not going to have that kind of leadership, that ability to build an organization. So there's going to be very few, and they're going to be carried along by moving smartly into the growing sub-markets. Second story I want to tell you is about making gypsum products. In Ethiopia, here's another barrier. It's notorious, it's actually so commonplace, I didn't even bother to include it in the list of big fixable problems, but it's notorious that uh, mid-sized finance for mid-sized companies is hard to get. Well, everyone knows this. So here's a gypsum maker, mid-sized company making building products in Ethiopia, and he goes along and he looks for finance. And this guy is a well-established company. He wants to make a new product, it's based on gypsum. Gypsum is an area where Ethiopia has a comparative advantage. They have great deposits of high quality gypsum. So this, from an economist's point of view, is a perfect business opportunity. But it gets turned down. It gets turned down by the private sector banks, it gets turned down by the public sector banks, and he doesn't go ahead with the project. Why? Well, the guys tell him, first of all, um, we've never made this in Ethiopia before. So how do we know you'll be able to meet world class quality standards and compete against imports? Why should we support this? And secondly, this is only import substitution. We want to support exports. Now, I've been told that in principle, Ethiopia has moved away from this orientation towards exports only, never mind import penetration. But to an economist, these two are exactly equivalent. They do just the same for your balance of payments. Now, I've been told that that battle has already been won in Ethiopia, and as far as the government is concerned, import substitution should be on a par with export uh, promotion when in the giving of finance. But here's an example of a company that's finding it hard to grow. So, I'm telling you, there are barriers of this kind, there are business opportunities, but many of them are coming out of businesses that have already grown to be a stable mid-sized business. Very few of the microfinance supported companies will grow to be that. And you really have to ask, if you're interested in long-run, large-scale employment generation, don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I'm not saying anything against small companies or microfinance, but I'm saying Look at the mid-sized companies. Look at the guys that have obvious potential to expand. 
ask what roadblocks are in their way. So I just want balance. Okay, question. Uh, you Hi. Um, I would like to know where you think the WTO comes in in all of this because um, a lot of the things you've quite rightly talked about involve capability building and um, some level of uh, nurturing infant industries which is absolutely vital and also technology transfer doesn't just happen, you need to force it to happen because developing countries are not often in a position to force this technology transfer to happen. And it seems to me that the WTO either bans half of the ways that that can happen. If it doesn't ban them outright, countries spend half their time worrying about, you know, avoiding trims and trips, being compliant, and that takes away a lot of uh, energy that could have been put into actually, you know, setting up businesses. So. Uh, is it the case, possibly, that the WTO is at least um, anti this kind of thing, uh, if not completely uh, stops it from happening at all? I had a lovely heading on one of my slides called Big Questions, Small Answers. Um, that was a big question, I'm going to give you a small answer. Um, I don't want to get drawn into this very large and complex issue um, at this this venue. Um, I think that there certainly are some aspects of the global trading regime that are frankly very unhelpful. Uh, there are also some aspects, especially in terms of opening up markets to the poorest countries that have been very progressive. Um, I think if we were to have a, a discussion of which are the good bits and which are the bad bits and who are the unhelpful lobbies behind some of these measures, uh, that would be a talk for a different day. So I'm going to adopt this. <laughs> Jeff, let me, let me jump in with the, with the question myself. Um, you, so you, you talked about the shortage of mid-level managers as, as one of the keys, and that one of the, for, uh, one of the capabilities is the yeah. ability to manage a mid-sized firm. Um, what either from, where, so the question is, where, where do these mid-level managers come from? And, and, it, and it, if you think about the, the places where you're doing the enterprise map, mapping, where there are very few large firms, uh, where, where, where do they come from? Where, where do these large firms find managers? Uh, this gives me another chance to talk about India, which is always a good thing to do. Um, suppose you look at um, the biggest business group in India. They internalize an awful lot of externalities because they're working on a huge scale. They can have their own MBA granting college. They can train their own managers. They can move them around across different businesses in the group. This happens in a smaller way in smaller countries. Um, if you look at the way one of the large business groups in Tanzania operates its businesses, of course, one of the great advantages for them in moving horizontally into filling yet another gap in the market that's not filled is because they have mid-level managers that are well trained in the ways of the company and they know enough that they can put them in there and they run the new business well. So they're growing their own. It happens in lots of ways and there is, of course, a public sector dimension to this. Um, and it's not enough that the guys have MBAs. The good stuff they learn by actually having a real job in a real company for a while. And so this is one of the great horizontal spillovers, as it were, that happen. And you're looking often at second best solutions to the fact that you don't have a thick market in middle managers. But I would emphasize that it's not just a shortage of middle managers. That's why I say I wanted a more nuanced view of hunting the heffalum. Um, it's not just the shortage of an entrepreneur or the shortage of a middle manager. I think the proximate causes of wealth, not the deep causes. The deep causes lie in the usual list that you know, institutional economists have taught us to use. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with any of that. But the channel through which all those good things flow into wealth creation is the channel of private sector companies. And, uh, a key to this is these average level mid-sized companies and 
it is those well-functioning companies that are the conduit. And they involve the putting together of a well-functioning, successful company. Believe me, it's hard. Um, most academics don't discover this until they reach their 50s and they have to take their turn as head of department. And suddenly they realize what it's like to run an organization. And they realize, actually, this is much harder than being an academic. You know, that's why a lot of guys like me are academics. Um, so this is hard. So um, I think the, the scarce resource is there, and, and you've got lots of second best solutions. Other, other questions? I think you focused for um, certainly the EPA project and a lot of your talk on manufacturing um, and how the implication of shifting the demand curve is very important. In the non tradable um, sectors, services, which is a great part of the large number of economies uh, that you're looking at, um, do you envisage seeing the same big principal problems? Yeah. The answer is going to be again. Yeah. I, I think two thirds or three quarters of the issues are just the same. Um, obviously, some things are missing. You know, the technology dimension is very different. The question of uh, meeting international supply chains is usually not an issue, but the quality issues um, remain the same. Talk about Let's wait, 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 wait for the, the mic. Hi, uh, you talked about business being an uh, audience for the enterprise maps. Have you had any feedback uh, from the European? The European uh, uh, we, had, we had a couple of very gratifying letters from Chinese companies saying we're opening up a, a unit in Ethiopia. Thanks for the book. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, when you were talking about Tanzin, Tanzania, the company which changed from um, Aquafresh, I think it was, Aquafresh, yeah. Yeah, to soft drinks, yep. and they uh, found this out by looking at the heavily demanded um, imports of soft drinks mm -hmm. and uh, how they were extremely high branded, so it was hard to get into that kind of market from um, a domestic local company kind of viewpoint. So I was just wondering, from how they looked at that and looked at kind of like the imports and how they could solve that problem mm. from this whole gap in the market, do you think that is quite rare from no. companies? No, I, the, the, I think the lesson from the Aquafresh story was not, hey, weren't we very clever to get into soft drinks? Because lots of people get into soft drinks. It's been flavor of the month for the past 10 or 12 years in Ethiopia and Tanzania and elsewhere. Uh, the point that I was going from the Aquafresh story uh, was not that they went to that particular market, but that they found a new market, and it was a growing market. That wasn't a difficult thing to do. But the point was, they weren't driven out of business. Even though their own textile operation was facing such price competition, they couldn't survive. They had a very well-functioning mid-sized firm, and so they could jump ship. They had the valuable scarce resource to take with them. The scarce resource wasn't, we can make textiles. The scarce resource was, we have a very well-functioning mid-sized company. What would we do? It wasn't hard to answer the question once you ask the question. But what I'm trying to point out is, look, you see stuff happening that suggests that if you've got a well-functioning mid-sized company, there are lots of opportunities there. So let me tell you another lovely Indian story. There was a story in the Sunday Times, must be 20 years ago. Um, it's about time we stopped talking about Africa and started talking about the UK. Here's a lovely story about the UK. Do you think everything is good here? Sunday Times 20 years ago, they interviewed this lovely Indian businessman. I said to him, look, your brother and your cousin and all the other Indians you know, they went to the United States and set up businesses to make themselves rich. Why did you come to Britain? He said, in the United States, I'd have to work so hard. Here the sun comes to the market, you can't lose money. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Now, um, all of these stories are success cases. Mm. Do you uh, have stories on the other side? And, uh, do I do fail? Well, there are lessons. Uh, there are lessons. Uh, how, how to go
because everybody has something to take along, to take along to jump ship. Yeah. Were there cases of good jumping ship into even worse ships? And then, uh, what, what happened to them? Yeah. Who, who, who carried the costs of the Is it the society? Yeah, 